G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got a pretty fun tutorial where I'm going to show you how you can build a spider graph component using an annotation family in Revit. So what is a spider graph? Well, if you haven't seen these before, they're a great way to plot multiple variables in a design or a study, and they work on the same visual scale. So from the center to the edge is essentially like a percentage scale. So if you have something that's between say zero and a million and something that's between zero and a thousand, well, you can plot these together within their own domains at the same visual scale, which will be quite hard to do on a graph where it has an actual numerical scale. Because obviously these values are way apart each other. Um, each side from there is essentially just connected as a point and it forms this region, which is really easy to visually compare between multiple spider graphs. So I like to use them when I do things like a feasibility study, where you might be looking at some values like yields or areas, and you just want to quickly compare options. And obviously with things like the generative design tool, uh, these could be a handy little graphic uh, to capture the results of those studies as well. Now, unfortunately, I am going to be using a angular constraint system to achieve some of these controls. And sometimes these can give pretty inconsistent results. I might even run into some errors along the way. Uh, but I'm going to show you at least the most stable method um, that I've found for building the constraints of this element. And I am going to be building it to a fixed number of elements around the wheel. So if you do want to have a, a variable angle of each section of the graph, that's quite hard to do. I found that, that the constraints will tend to break if you do introduce this level of control into the component. So I'm going to be building a graph with six components to measure in this case. So let's dive in. So I'm just in Revit 2020, uh, point, I think point 2.3. Point um, I'm going to make a new family and I'm just going to start by building a generic annotation. And I'm going to be building, first of all, just one sixth of the wheel of the graph. So I'm going to build one component and then use the same component six times. Obviously that means we only have to model something once instead of six times, so much more efficient. So I'm going to begin by drawing some reference lines. I'm going to begin probably just by drawing a few of the main constraints. Uh, in this case, there's a few that I'll need. So I'm going to begin just by drawing uh, one constraint this way. And this is going to be the first value along my spider graph. So I'm going to draw a wheel like this. I'm going to have another reference line that I'm just going to rotate around by 60 degrees. Now unjoin, you might get some joining uh, warnings here and there, depending on how the reference lines try to connect. But in this case, I am just going to constrain this and lock it so that it's forced to be at 60 degrees to the main reference plane. This is going to be one constraint we're going to establish. I also need another one, and this is going to be for the overall length of the graph. So this is going to be my portion of my graph, and this is going to be the point that my spider reaches. I'm also going to add another reference line between these two points. I'm then going to do the same here, but I'm going to model a little reference line here at 90 degrees, well, 60 degrees to the main axis. I'm going to make sure that this is constrained so that it's always at 90 degrees. And the reason I need one of these is because I'm going to have multiple elements to dimension to keep locked. So I'm going to be setting up essentially the same, the same types of constraints in this case. I'm also going to make a angular lock between this reference line as well. And I found that this keeps everything pretty stably held together. From there, I'm just going to do two more dimensions to keep those locked down. I don't believe you should need dimensions here, but I like to add them anyway, just to be, just to be sure. Okay, so at this point we have the main reference planes to hold this all together. We need two more reference lines. So I'm going to click from here to here and from here to here. And we should have something that looks a little bit like that at this point. So we have all the reference lines we need to hold our graph together. Now we need to set up our actual constraints. So I'm going to put a dimension here and here. And these are going to control the spider on each side. And they're going to make two more here. And in this case, I'm just going to take both of these and associate a parameter to them. In this case, I'm just going to call this length. So it's the length of my overall graph in this case. This should align both of them to the same parameter because they can't be two different values anymore. And that's going to create a new value. And I'm going to call this length L, but I'm going to be using an override formula to protect this from ever being zero on either side of the reference line. 
because if one of these lines goes to zero, it obviously breaks and the spider graph component won't work. So I'm going to call this length L override. And I'm also going to do another one on this side. And I'm going to call this one uh, length R override. And at this point, we have all of the elements we need in order to constrain our component. We're going to add all the lines and filled regions last of all. We're going to go and add some actual constraints here. And I might just save this component first as well. I actually just call this a uh, spider section because it's one piece of the spider graph. So we're going to nest this into another family. I'm going to go to the type properties and I'm going to have to go and add the actual length L value. So in this case, this will be the value that is actually set by the user in the graph. So I'm going to make this an instance based parameter. And I'm also going to make a length R. Now in this case, I'm just going to set them to two arbitrary values by default but we are gonna to have to protect these. So I'm gonna move these overrides to the other category. This is where I like to put um, parameters that are typically driven by formulas because the user doesn't need to really interact with them. So I'm gonna be working on a certain, some conditions here. So in this case, if length L is less than one, I wanna make it one. And if it's, if it's more than uh, the length minus one, I want it to be that. So I never want it to be absolutely zero or absolutely 100, at least visually. So in this case, this is just controlling the visuals. So I'm gonna say if, if length L is less than one, then I'm gonna trigger a condition in this case. I'm gonna say, if it's less than one, it has to be one. But if it's not, I'm gonna say another if condition. I'm gonna say if length, uh, length L is greater than length minus one. So one off the overall maximum. I'm gonna say in that case that it must equal length minus one. Otherwise it is allowed to be length L and then just close the bracket twice. So in this case, it protects it from ever being absolutely zero or absolutely the full length of the graph. I'm gonna copy that formula and just replace every occurrence of length L with length R in the override for R as well. And this will stop those spokes from ever breaking. So I think I've missed a space somewhere. There we go. So that's probably the hardest thing to do in this case, just to protect the formula. So if I make length L uh, say zero, we can see it's locked into one. If I make it something that's larger than the length, like 55, we can see it's locked into 49. So this will essentially protect our graph. Let's make the length um, 100 and 30 and 60 just some new values. And we can see in this case, those constraints are still maintaining themselves. So now let's actually set up some lines in the graph. So I'm gonna to go to object styles and I'm just gonna make some new sub styles. Firstly, I'll just, I'll make one called um, spider frame. And this is just the border of the spider, the spider graph. By default, I'll let its, uh, its line color be black and its line weight be three. I'll set up one called a uh, spider region and this will be the border of the fill in the graph. I'll make that three and I'll make it a blue color, so a different color. So in this case, I'm going to create some lines and I'm first of all, just gonna establish the spider frame. So I'm just gonna pick, pick line on those two edge lines and also pick this one as well. I'm gonna trim those lines also. Uh, actually, in that case, I might, uh, I might instead let those finish here. And I'm gonna trim them up to a spider region line across the middle. And that way these are all trimmed. I'm then gonna create two more spider region lines on the inner lines in this case. So that means we now have no overlapping lines. And if I isolate these, you'll see something like that. Now in this case, we may wanna sometimes show this as a filled graphic instead. So I'm just gonna select these border lines and for the visible setting, actually I'll let these always be on, but what I'll do is create a filled region. And I'll also use the spider region border and I'll just tab select to make sure that I'm selecting my reference lines. And I'll just create a new fill style. I'll just call this spider fill. And I'll make sure it's a color that complements the graph well, such as a, a blue but I'll add a visibility parameter to this and I'll just say filled. So the user can control whether the graph is in fact filled. I'll just put that under visibility. Okay, so we need a few more things here because obviously the, the scale of the graph is determined by a few conditions. 
So in this case, I'm going to let the user always drive the edge of this graph based on a factor between 0 and 100. So even if our length is something that's not between 0 and 100, I want to trigger the control for the user to do this. So I'm going to set the length to something that's not 100. I'll make it something like, say, 70. And we can see our graph component is still working. But now I'm going to go and actually scale my value. So in this case, I'm going to introduce a, a scale limit in this case. So I'm going to have to add uh, probably a, what I'll just call like a total. I'll call this upper value and I'll make it instance based. And this is going to be a number, not a length. I'm also in this case going to create a, a scaled value so that I can scale down the value of the first piece. So I'll call this factor left. And I'll make this again a number and factor right. And I'll make that a number as well. So we're removing the units from how we're measuring these values. So in this case, I'll say that my upper value is 100%. And in this case, we're gonna to have to work instead with our factor length. So in this case, I'll say factor one is say 65 and 85. Now we're gonna use this relationship between these values to drive the value of length L and length R. So in this case, I do need to create a formula. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my factor L value and say that my left length has to be equal to the factor divided by the upper value. So we know the percentage between those two values times the length. And this will put that to that percentage along that edge of the graph, regardless of the value of the graph. And this means we can also scale the size of our graph as well. I'm gonna do the same with the right side. Uh, in this, so you see what I've said when sometimes the constraints really don't don't work how you want them to. So in this case, we've sort of run into a bit of a, a bit of a bug, unfortunately, um, where this component just hasn't hasn't locked itself the way it should. Uh, quite frustrating, but not not overall surprising, um, given that Revit does these things. So I may have to may have to reconstrain these elements, unfortunately. Very frustrating. But like I said, the angular constraints in Revit are super unpredictable. Um, they don't always work how you want them to. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete, I'm going to delete all these references, and I'm just going to set up this side of my graph again. Really annoying. Sorry about that. But I did want to show that sometimes these things don't work as you wish they would. So this time, what I'm going to do, I'm going to lock the end of that reference line here just to force it to stay on that point, which is sort of tricking Revit into forcing it to have to do something it's trying not to do. Now, if I start a reference line from that point, it should hopefully remain constrained. And I'll take that down to 30 degrees because I know this needs to be 60. So I'll do my first line and then I'll do my second line after that. And before I do anything else, I'm just gonna constrain these with an angle. And hopefully this should at least keep these robust this time. But yeah, pretty pretty frustrating. Now if I create these at 90 degrees, hopefully we're, we're gonna see it work this time. Feel free to jump ahead a little bit to I've got back to the graph the way it was, because I'm really now just setting up the constraints to the way they were before, before that happened. Um, so hopefully now, we should see a, a graph that will behave and stay on the right point. Like I said, reference lines really are quite um quite unpredictable. So I'll just set up these spider frames again. And what I'll do is I'll just do these all as one and then just change their object style after, just to save a few clicks. Okay, and I'll add my field region, and hopefully this should now be forced to stay, <laughs> to stay where it was before. But yeah, reference lines don't quite seem to be very stable sometimes in how they position themselves. Okay, so we're back to where we were. So fingers crossed, um, this works. Let's just change the scale of our graph. Okay, so it works except for the fact that we haven't obviously added those dimensions. I'll add that length back again and I'll add the override for the right as well. Okay, so now hopefully we have, all, yeah, there we go. Now we have a graph that's scaling correctly along here. And I'll just flex a couple of values just to make sure these are working too. Okay, they're working too. Perfect.
So at this point, we've essentially set up everything except for a couple of labels that we can introduce to the graph to put headers and values on top of the edge of the graph. So this is gonna be one side of each triangle of the graph if you can picture them all together in the final component. So I'm gonna create two generic annotations that can sit here. Now I'm gonna make them families so that I can constrain them to their center point. So in this case, I'm gonna make a new generic annotation. And in this case, I'm gonna create a value or a label parameter. So I'm gonna create a label. I'm just gonna click in the middle. And I'm gonna create a new parameter. And I'm just gonna call this value. I'm gonna make this an instance based and a text parameter. And just place that in there like this. I'm gonna make that, I'll make it, I'll leave it at three millimeters, but I'm gonna make it transparent. Um, and I'm also just gonna turn off this wrap between parameters so that it always stays on a single line. But otherwise that's pretty much it. That's one of our parameters done. So this is gonna be our text value. So I'll just, I'll just call this typical because there's only one type. And I'll just save this as a component. Make sure it's not a shared component. I'll call this um, value marker. So in this case, this will be, actually this is gonna be like a, a title marker actually. So it may be better, may be better to call this title. So what I'll do is I'll save this again and I'll go back to the value marker. Because this is just a text value. But what we need is also a, a number value for the other one. So I'm gonna go back and open value marker and I'm just gonna change this to a different type of parameter. So I'm gonna modify this parameter. Um, I might just need to create a new one actually. Um, I'll just temporarily rename this to title just so I can create a new parameter called value. And I'm gonna to have to make this of the type number and instance based. Then I'll add this instead. And before you finish this, make sure you go and modify the number to a fixed number with zero decimal places. Now this should be a value marker. So I should be able to load both of these in as nested components. So I'll just go navigate to my value marker and my title marker. And if I just take this reference line here, I can offset this by a nominal distance and just add a dimension between the first and the length and the second and the first. And just associate a parameter to these and just call this marker spacing. And this will let you control the spacing of the text as well. I'm then gonna create a symbol and I'll just place my value marker and I'll also place a copy of the title marker. Now in this case, you might wish to put visibility parameters on them as well. Let's say title on, on a visibility basis and also value on. On a visibility basis. We also wanna associate some values to these as well. So in this case, first of all, I'm gonna take my title and I'm just gonna associate a value and just call this title as a text value. I'm then gonna take this value. And in this case, um, I guess I could, I could associate a number at the component level, but I'd rather just control this at the surface level in case someone wants the value to read differently um, in the context of their graph. So in this case, I'm just gonna take this and call it value. I'll put it under text so it's with the other title value. And I'll put in just a placeholder, I'll just call this title, and I'll say the value is a uh, five. But these are instance based, so we can set them however we want at the next level. And I'll just align these, and because I've made them nested, I can use their, their reference planes to line them up. At this point, we've created one piece of the spider graph. The good news is we're not gonna go and do this six times. We're gonna use this as a nested component. So before you finish up, you may wish to just clean up your thumbnail view just by turning off some of the annotation styles. And we'll just make sure we've given this a name. I'll call this typical. Okay, so that's the easy part um, pretty much done at this point. So we're gonna make a new generic annotation. And this is gonna be the host of all the pieces of the spider graph. Now I just realized I forgot to do one thing. Make sure in these that you do, uh, do make sure that keep text readable is turned off and the text item is also told not to be readable as well. This way when it rotates around, the, the text won't try to rotate itself as well. 
it'll just stay parallel to the spider graph. So I'll just load those back in. And now we should be able to use this in our new family. So if we go and make a new generic annotation, save this and just load this down as a nested component, we can see now we have one piece of our spider graph. So if we just place this on the center, and you could do a polar array, or you could just copy and rotate, and just rotate them 60 degrees at a time. You can see we're essentially building uh, the spokes of the spider graph. Now make sure you don't mirror these components. So I'll copy these together and just rotate them by 180 degrees around the center. Because if you mirror them, the relationship between the values will get a little bit messed up. So at this point, you can imagine that the left value of this spoke and the right value of this spoke essentially line up to match each other to, to create the same connection point for the spider graph. But first of all, we're just gonna set some parameters for all of these elements together at the same time. Because some of these things are globally controlled. For example, the length of the graph. So we can change the length of the graph using just this parameter for each one. So we're gonna make this just the graph size on an instance basis. So that the user can always scale the graph to suit. Um, we can also just add another dimension for the marker spacing. We'll just call this text spacing. And we can also say, is the graph filled? And we'll just make that a visibility parameter. Um, we can also say, are titles on? And also, are values on as well? Then we have just a couple of ways to scale in this case. Now it's up to you whether you want to create a upper value for every single arm of your graph, or whether you're gonna compute the values in some other way, uh, say using Dynamo and remapping them to the same range. In my case, I usually remap my values to the same range, which is 100. So I'm just gonna give them a common upper value. This is what you might also call the top of the domain of your value as well. And we'll just put this under data. So by default, everything will be mapped between 0 and 100. So at this point, the only things that we need to associate are titles, the values themselves, and also the factors that they are constrained to. Now let's say in this case that the value maybe, uh, we might actually just associate the value as the actual factor as well instead. I think that's probably easier. We're just gonna say, what is it between 0 and 100 for now? Now you could go and create six parameters that are separate to the values themselves, but obviously that's data that you need to maintain separately. Now something like Dynamo could do that potentially. In my case, I'm gonna try and de-risk, I guess, how I'm working. So in this case, we're gonna set the first value as uh, this value here, but also the factor. So we're gonna say factor L is equal to value one as a number parameter. I'll set this on my data. And I can also go to the right and say that the right factor of this one is value one. And now you can see that these line up because essentially they are the same value. As you can guess, we're just gonna be going around at this point and essentially just creating new parameters for each one. So this part obviously, you know, it's not the most exciting thing to watch, um, but you know, you'll, you'll need to do this as well. And I can just use the same parameter. In this case, we'll be using value two. And then value three on the right. Value three on the left. And as we go, we'll end up with a spider graph that looks um, pretty pretty good because everything's gonna start lining up, which is pretty much what creates the, the effective graphic of a spider graph. Now you could do the same for the titles as well. Again, I'm just gonna skip that part because it's obviously not very exciting. Um, just, I think it'll be better that, you know, you, you sort of understand that you can associate these parameters down one level if you want. Um, but just to not waste too much of your time, I'd rather you get to have a look at that instead. But I'm almost done. Create our last value. And then go to our last spoke. Actually, that's meant to be value, value five. Whoops, I think I just put in something wrong. There we go. This is value six and the left value for value six and we're back at the start. 
So at that point, we've created the spider graph that's connected on all sides, which is pretty much effectively um, what we aim to do in this tutorial. So we can test a few things, like we can change the graph size, we can toggle a couple of the values, but I'm probably gonna take this into Dynamo at the end and just use Dynamo to test and flex some of those values. And we can see, there we go, that it's effectively working like a functional spider graph. So for now, I'm just gonna make these all the same. And I'm just gonna turn off the reference lines and planes. And there you have it, we have a spider graph. Now in this case, I believe I've set one value incorrectly here. So this needs to be value two. That is a good way to maybe audit. Um, so what you can do is go 15, 25, 35, and just see if it climbs around the circle. Okay, no, so in this case, that looks like I've missed a few things. Value one, 35, 55, 65. So that looks pretty good. Now everything's set properly. So it's probably good to visually audit like that before, um, before you go to the next step as well. I'm just gonna call this typical because most spider graphs will typically be the same. Most of this is instance based. And usually I like to just clear out the fill patterns that are in here because we didn't use them. So if you don't use these standard fill patterns, obviously they'll come into the project if you load this family. And also the materials will just delete all the materials that we didn't have to use because it's an annotation family. And I'll just purge those material assets. And we're done, I'll just save this and just call this spider graph. So let's create a new project and just load this in. So I'm, I'm just gonna use a no template in this case, just a metric template. I'm gonna connect this up to Dynamo. So I'll just close my wedge, load in my spider graph, and I'm gonna open up Dynamo and just create a really basic set parameter script so that we can just test and flex our spider graph a little bit. So in this case, we are working between zero and 100. So we're just gonna work with those values because remember we can change the upper value to be something different if we want to. But in this case, we're just dealing with this as 100. So I'm gonna make a new graph and I'm gonna make a integer slider. We could do a number slider actually, number's okay. We're gonna go between um, zero and 100 with a step of five. And we're gonna make six of these because we have six spider graph values essentially. I'm gonna make one more slider for the size of my graph. For that one, I'm just gonna work between uh, 20, uh, 25 and 75 with a step of five. I'm gonna use a list.create node just to put these all together as values. I'll just connect them all into one list because we're gonna set these all to a list of parameters. I'm just gonna create a code block that contains all the names of my parameter values. So in this case, uh, I'll make them strings and I'll just type in upper value, value one, value two, value three, value four. See so again, a pretty repetitive part of the script. And that creates a list of seven parameter names. And I also need to select my graph itself using a select model element. So I'll pick my graph. I'll get an element set parameter by name. And I'll take my parameter values from this list, my parameter names from this list and my element. We can see to begin with, everything's already working by the looks of it. Um, I can obviously go and change my, in this case, my graph size. I don't believe that's, that, oh no, I've done my upper value, whoops. So in this case, I actually need to do graph size as that parameter name. Make sure to get the right case as well. There we go. Now I can set this back to 100. And I should be able to change my graph size. Yep. If I zoom in, I should also be able to start changing the values of my spider graph. And you can start to see these climb up the arms of the spider graph. And we're starting to create a pretty um, compelling visual. Now, sometimes you will find some graphical bugs just because reference lines in Revit aren't that stable sometimes. Notice in this case, see this, you know, it doesn't know what to do when it's very small. So you will sometimes find that this graphic might need um, a little bit of help to make sure it doesn't hit a value that breaks. I find typically around the really small or the really large values it can happen, um, which can be a little bit frustrating. Uh, but in this case, for the most part, you should find the graph fairly stable. 
Um, and you can see that if you scale the graph, it can visually also scale as well. So you don't have to go and build lots of copies of the graph at different sizes to control that. So hopefully this has been an interesting tutorial and a way to show you to use families in a more creative way to achieve um, some interesting outcomes. Um, I certainly enjoyed setting up this component despite the fact that reference lines can be a little bit frustrating. Um, and I'm glad that it broke at one bit just so I could show you how you could fix that problem. The files for this will be on GitHub, including my actual spider graph as well, just in case you had some trouble building it, but you still want a spider graph for yourself. So if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so, and I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks, take care, bye.